Welcome back to the Author Your Dream podcast. I'm Kenny McKay and this is episode one. Today I am so excited to share with you an interview that I had with the author of a wordless children's book with an incredible message. Today my guest is going to share with us her journey as an author. She also takes us through the process of writing her children's book and provides some fantastic tips not just for children's authors but for anyone who aspires to be an author. Stick around because I really think you're going to enjoy this episode. Welcome to Author Your Dream, a podcast dedicated to helping you as you fulfill your dream of writing and publishing a book. With your host, Kenny McKay. Today, I want to welcome my guest, Dagny Griffin. Dagny is a successful ghostwriter, editor, and English instructor, and she has also just released her first work as an author, a book called Shine. Shine is a children's book with an incredible message that I really think is so on point for today, not just for kids, but also for adults. Dagny, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Well, thank you for having me, Kenny. I appreciate it. (laughs) So I'd like to start out with just hearing a little bit about your author journey, because I know as an author myself, hearing other people's stories and how they came along in their journey to publishing is really encouraging and inspiring. And a lot of our listeners are going to be people who are aspiring authors from all different backgrounds and walks of life. And so I really think that would really add value to them. Okay, absolutely. So um, it's been in my heart to write since I was about eight years old. And so it's something that was always there, but uh, it's been a long journey. And I've written all along the way. I always knew I wanted to write, but ended up um, becoming an editor first. So helping other people write for about, and which I still do for about 10. Well, first I was an English instructor and uh, taught people composition. So I did a lot of teaching of writing, um, then went on to be an editor and a ghostwriter, which I still do as well. And um, in a lot of ways that prepared me for being an author myself. Uh, I don't know, just something about helping. It was almost like being an understudy Mm -hmm. to a lot of people Um, and learning so many things about words and and ways to manipulate words. And, you know, I mean, the only way to really write is to write, you know, I mean, that's, that's the only way to really learn, you know, and then to have feedback, of course. So you, if you write in a vacuum, you're kind of lost because you don't know if it's good or bad. Um, But yeah, that, that's what I did. And the irony of it is, Um, I've known I've always wanted to write and my first book this one is a wordless picture book so it God makes me laugh (laughs) my first journey into authorship is with a wordless picture book (laughs) was that something that just happened or was that like a a conscious choice no no it was something that just happened yeah it was just something that the way I got the idea I mean it just Mm -hmm. It, it was wordless. I don't know how else to explain it. <laughs> <It's funny. laughs> That's great. Yeah. And I have written other things that uh, haven't been published yet. You know, a couple of novels, but this was the one that just, you know, God will give you projects sometimes and you know, it's God because it doesn't go away. I mean, mm. it just won't go away. You know, it just keeps at you and keeps at you. And it, you are almost become the babysitter more than the actual author, you know, it's like, okay, this is your baby, Lord, let's, you know, let's bring it where it needs to go. So that's kind of how it is. That's great. So tell us about how you got started. Okay, so it's interesting. I was not even thinking about doing a book. I was reading um, a book by Rick Renner called Dream Thieves, uh, an amazing book. And one of the things he was talking about was when he first went, he was a missionary, well, he still is a missionary to the Soviet Union. And when he first went after the wall fell, he talked about driving along the border, trying to find a way into the country, uh, into Russia, and just seeing the devastation from the communism and how people were, you know, their heads were down, everything was dark and gray and drab, and the city was, the cities were filthy, the towns were filthy, and all, the way he explained it, I got this visual image of all these people walking. They're just completely destitute, their heads down, you know, 
um, in shadow, this, this dirty, dreary city behind them, and they're all walking one way, just like to nowhere. And then all of a sudden, on the other side of the street, I see this little pop of color, this little girl in a yellow raincoat with this huge grin on her face, completely oblivious to what was going on on the other side of the street. And what happened as she walked, people on the other side of the street started to look at her and things, and, and it happened every day. And, and they looked at her and like their scarf would change color. People would look at her first and then their scarf would change color. And the next day, a couple of people, their hats and their scarves would change color. And, and eventually some of the people that turned to color came to her side. And I saw this whole thing. I just saw it. So there were never any words. And what I realized, it told the story of how one person can influence their world um, just by shining the light of God. And the original name of the book was Christ in Me. That was what I originally called it. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I pitched it to the publishers, I changed it to God in Me. I thought, well, that gives a little more, a little broader view. But when we talked to the publisher about it, one day, and you have to come on this story, one day, the five of us, five women on the telephone, okay, all strong-minded business women, Christians, but all strong-minded business women, we're all sitting on the phone, and I was set on this, this title, right? And one of, the, one of the ladies, I think it was um, the project manager for the book, she says, by the way, we, we've been thinking about a different name, and I'm like, whatever <laughs> this is i am not changing it and she said how about shine and there was like dead silence on the phone and at the same time these five women all five of us went that's amazing that's the name of the book oh my gosh you know it was just it was awesome but mm -hmm. <laughs> because that was what she was doing you know that's just shining the light so mm, that's such a great story yeah, that's yeah. funny. <laughs> oh, I love that, like, because you're an editor as well. So you give suggestions to authors to change Absolutely. things. And now yes. you're receiving it. <laughs> Absolutely. It was very different being on the other side of the yeah. coin. I, I really liked it. I mean, one thing I had learned, I've learned as an author is, you know, you have to, um, you have to convince people that, that you're helping them that it's in their best interest, you know, that you really do know what you're doing. You're not trying to kill their baby. You're trying to help their baby live, you know? So, so being on the other end of that, I've always been really open to feedback and I know good feedback when I hear it mm. because I've had to learn to give good feedback, you know? So it's funny. Again, all preparation. You got such a different perspective because I'm an author, but I'm not an editor. So yes. when I, when I did my book, it was, okay, I've got this. I love this. I absolutely love this section. And I send it off to an editor and they're like, uh, you should probably reword this. It's too wordy. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> no, I love this. <laughs> I know. And you like what you said that you're not trying to kill their baby. You're trying to that's, help them live. I love yeah, that. That's you know? true. That's, that's the job. And sometimes it means slash and burn. I mean, that's just yeah. part of the, part of the process. How many, revisions did you go through with shine yeah so it's interesting because it's a, a wordless picture book i do draw and so when i first got the idea i drew it out um and it was a 32 page you know if you know anything about children's books or really any books they go in um galleys of eight because that's how publishing works of course now that it's digital there's mm -hmm. a digital aspect i don't know if it's always the same but i still was just thinking eight, so 32, and I drew everything out, had the whole idea, sat on it, then did it again probably two years later, started looking for an illustrator, and then found out uh, he had some of his own ideas, and I love this illustrator, but it's funny that you, I guess I should tell this story too at the same time, because it's kind of part of it. Um, I originally wanted to independently publish. I wanted to self-publish. And part of the reason was I've been, I've worked for publishing companies, okay? I know just from a basic standpoint to take your work and to give it to a company where you're only going to make back 10%, this is the practical aspect of it, um, when you, when a lot of them didn't do the advertising, they don't do really much of anything other than print it and edit it. I'm sorry to say, but that's that's what's happened to the industry. Mm. 
And so I really thought, well, I'm better off self-publishing. So start looking into it, get an illustrator to do a couple of sketches for me, and then find out that to do the whole book at, and the layout that he had come up with, which was wonderful, it was going to cost me about $8,000, which I just didn't happen to have. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I thought, all right, this isn't going to work. Lord, you've got to have something else. I mean, I know I need to put this book out, but either, you know, open, well, you know, we know money doesn't come from heaven. So, you know, I need it from somewhere or I need another idea. Well, about two months later, I'd talked to a literary agent friend of mine and we've just been friends for a year at that point. I was talking to her about my novels. But then I said to her, hey, would you take this book on? It's a wordless picture book. What do you think? She's like, well, okay, we'll try it. So then um, I took the ideas I had. I, I drew out about six drawings from my mm -hmm. sketches. And she used those initially to try to get people interested in the book. And then what I had gotten from the illustrator. Then uh, we took all that and she shopped that around and we had interest. And so once we had interest and, um, and the interest was from Tyndale, which I can't tell you how wonderful they are. When, once we got Tyndale, I took PowerPoint I, and I wrote out the story page by page, what I saw. So I sent that to the publisher. From there, I talked to an editor. So we actually edited the where those picture books. She went through and said, okay, and, and it was more like structural editing. She's like, okay, this, you know, this doesn't work here, or what do you think about this? Or da 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 da. Got that, took it from 32 to 40 pages. And um, from there, it was kind of out of my hands. Went to the art director who chose an illustrator. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of had a say in it, but we ended up with yeah. this one illustrator that the art director really loved. So now there's two points of separation between me and mm. the story. And at some point, and, and there was a time I was going to get upset, not because anything was bad. They're wonderful over there. But the illustrations were so different than what I had imagined. I mean, it was so different. But when I was praying about it, and this is one thing to remember if you work with a publisher, it's no longer your book. <laughs> and, and really, it was never my book. It was always God's book. But what he showed me is once you put it in the hands of a publisher, it's a team effort. Mm. And you need, to be, um, you need to work as a team. You need to see yourself now as part of a team, not the main whatever. Right. And once I was able to do that, uh, it, it really, it was amazing. So I watched how she, how not just the art, adapt, art director adapted it, but how the illustrator adapted what the art director said. And so it, it went through several revisions to become what it is now, you know. So the, the basic story is, is still the same, but a lot of the elements changed over the process. Oh, no, that's, I love what you're saying, like being part of a team, you got to be flexible. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. As an independent author, like I liked doing, making all the decisions myself. I yeah. liked. Absolutely. But I do know that there are areas that as a only person working on it, that I'm not as strong in certain areas as someone else would be if I had them on my team. Yeah. You know, so it's that, it's that team mentality and being flexible. Like that's what I try and teach my kids and, and live my life by is to, you know, walk in love, not to be shocked and to be yeah. flexible. That's right. You know, and if you're rigid, then it's not going to work. You're just going to keep hitting, you know, butting heads with people and you're not going to get that book to where it needs to be, to be able to get out there in the world. And I, I will tell you this, honestly, as an editor, I had, I have worked with many authors that thought, okay, this is the way God gave it to me. Mm. And don't you dare touch it because, you know, almost like it's holy and mm. What I would say to them is you're really, you're doing yourself a disservice because what I would end up doing was a light proof, giving it back to them and them getting, you know, a thousand of them printed and them sitting in the garage because the book was no mm. good. 
take the input. Absolutely. Get as much input as you can. Get as many people to read it as you can. Yes, God gave it to you, but you are the imperfect vessel it came through. So don't think that just because you, you know, you heard it that way, you sat down and you wrote it all in one day and, you know, it's just not the way it works. You know, it is everything in the kingdom of God is a team effort. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no big I and little you, especially in, you know, especially in writing. Yeah. Oh, I love that. So your main character, Mia, Yes. is she based off of anybody? Interestingly, yes. She wasn't originally. It was just, I wanted the name Mia so um, girls especially could I internalize, mm. oh, this could be me. But um, she looks an awful lot like my granddaughter, which is interesting to me. Mm. So I, I had said that originally, given an idea of what I would like her to look like, and then they just went, they went a little different. And I really liked it. The first time my granddaughter opened the book, she goes, wow, she kind of looks like me. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, she does, doesn't she? And what I like is she, uh, Mia can look like a lot of kids, a lot mm. of girls. That's what I really liked about it. So mm. even though I didn't base it off of anyone, I would have to say my granddaughter did, you know, influence what I talked to the publishing company about. Yeah. Nice. What would you say to somebody who has a desire to write a children's book, but they're asking themselves that question, where do I start? It, it, it definitely starts with the inspiration. I mean, I'm all about hard work, mm -hmm. but the spark, in order for it to be something that's going to last, I, I believe it can't be generated as much as it can be discovered. It, it just needs to be discovered, you know, especially as Christians, there are God ideas. Mm. I mean, there are ideas he wants for books in the earth. And if we're open to those things, mm. he's, he's going to make sure we get that, that spark and that inspiration. Of course, once you get there, then it's work. Do your homework. You know, I looked at all sorts of other uh, wordless picture books, you know, and it's something that had always been a favorite of mine anyway. So mm. it's, I already had a lot of that under my belt, but started looking into, started really looking I love children's illustrations, but I started really looking at them and how they would tell a story. There's one, especially, I think the author, it's, it's an older one called Clown. And I think it's David Sedaris. But this is one of the most amazing stories. I mean, as an adult, I was in tears mm. by the end of this book and it's all pictures. And so um, I thought, wow, I really want this book to be that powerful that it mm. that it touches people that they're able to and go through it so you do your homework um if you're doing an independent if you're independent you still need to do you especially need to do homework mm. like i had gone to the small business association with all the numbers once i found out how much the illustrations were going to cost how many books i'd have to print cut the shipping for the books i picked out a ship uh, a printer everything so i knew that it was going to cost me for a thousand books between between ten and twelve thousand dollars wow yeah so what i because children's books are so expensive because the it's four color illustration mm. and so when I, I went to the small business association and said look this is what i have and uh and very interestingly uh, it's a mutual friend. I believe you know her. Do you know Jill Dietz? Um, the Dietz is Phil and Jill. I don't know. The name sounds familiar. Okay, maybe Probably that. by I face. Was thinking, yeah, I was yeah. thinking because Tiffany was good friends with him. Maybe I did know him. But she, she works for um, the Small Business Association. And she looked over my numbers. And I'm like, I'm looking at this. And it looks like I'm upside down already mm. before I even sold the first book. And I don't have any distribution. Right. So, you know, how is this going to work? And she looked at me and she said, it isn't, you know, you need to rethink this. And so having that counsel made a huge difference because even though you're, um, when God gives you a baby, it's like ministry. When God gives you something, it's your job to steward it, of course, with his mm -hmm. leading. So what, what happened, and, and here's the thing, I was so adamant about doing it myself. I think that's probably why it took so long. Mm. And I had my own pu little publishing company already set up, all this stuff. I was just da -da 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 -da, had it all, was trying to do it myself. But when it's when I stopped and said, okay, Lord, I can't do it this way. Mm. Duh. What's the way, Lord? <laughs> you know? 
And then within, I say two months, but it might have even been less mm -hmm. that, um, you know, the Lord opened the door and got it right in. And honestly, now I had worked with a, a, a writing group for five and a half years. We called it the writer's block out of our church. Great group of people. And I was, I mean, the preacher of don't go with a publishing company, you know, be independent, do it independently. It's just all around better. You make your own choices. I don't know. And I have just had to eat my words because I've never met people like the people at Tyndale mm -hmm. ever. I mean, they encourage me. It's every step of the way they send me cards just to encourage me, send me gifts. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they make me feel very much a part of what you're doing mm -hmm. a lot of times i hadn't seen that with publishers it was like okay especially the well they don't call them vanity presses anymore but self-pub you know mm -hmm. you're a number they don't care if your book's good you know <laughs> they don't right. they'll they say they edit a lot of times they don't edit i'm sorry to say or they do a very poor edit and then they charge people five mm -hmm. to seven thousand dollars to print this book and again the only thing they do for marketing is put it up on Amazon. So, so that was really breaking my heart to see people fall into that trap. So mm -hmm. I always said against it, but here's the thing, if it's God's way, it's going to be the right way and it's going to be the right publishers. I'd like to uh, talk about the message behind your book. Okay. You know, could you kind of just sum it up? Yeah. Shine, shine is the story of uh, how one person can influence their world mm -hmm. for good. Mm -hmm. And basically, that's that's what the main character does, you know. Throughout the the book, she just she just shines her light. She just my granddaughter says when she saw it, she said, "Oh, it's a book about shining your love," you know, and mm. and it is. Yeah. So I tried to broaden it because I've always felt this book shouldn't just be for Christians. Mm. So. Um, really especially children they under they don't understand the power of influence and if they'll use that power for good they can change the world around them even their family you know mm. start with their family uh start with the people around them just being good being kind showing the love of god you you literally change and we know this as christians you know mm. you literally change the world around you i've and and right now i find it so relevant because I'll go into the grocery store. Here, we're still allowed to go into the grocery store in mass, you know. And I'll go into the store and, you know, here's people trying to avoid me and stuff like that. And, you know, I try to be respectful of all mm. this. But I also try to be friendly. I try to say hi, you know, and start conversations, even if it's from across the aisle, you know. Because this is, people need, they need that touch. They just need mm. ki kindness. Mm. They need to be acknowledged. You know, right now, literally, people are treating each other like they have the plague. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's so much, um, there's so much oppression. I mean, to me, the, the idea of social distancing, I know it has, I know what the connotation is for the virus, mm -hmm. but to think of that, that's not a God idea, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he wants us to be together. He wants us to love each other. He wants us mm -hmm. to be able to give and have. That's his thing. So even if we have to do it within the confines of this right now, we still need to be doing it and even working harder. There are so many people right now that need that love, that kindness. They need to see mm -hmm. the face of God. And that's kindness and gentleness and love. And we're it. I mean, we're the light, you mm -hmm. know, so... That's, that's really the story of, you know, that's really what the story is. And, mm. and it's one that's very strong in my heart, you know. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Like we're like, we're in England, we're a bit further on than the States are. So like, we've got people calling the cops on their neighbors because they're out and about, you know, doing their one exercise with the kids. I'm trying to teach them that even in the worst situation, that's right. You can still show kindness. You can still show love Absolutely. towards people and Absolutely. i think a lot of times people get so caught up in the idea that it has to be this grand gesture yes. that they forget about the smile or the hello or the hey how's it going you know we walk around our neighborhood for our one exercise a day and we've been talking to people that we've never even seen before just saying hi checking in on them making sure they're okay yes 
the girls had an idea of uh, writing letters of encouragement to our neighbors. So we're using that as school. They're, right, they're coming up with the idea at the beginning of the week, and then they're practicing the writing and making it nice. Uh, and then on one of our walks on Friday, we'll go and we'll deliver it to somebody. Oh, that's fantastic, yeah. Kenny. I love yeah. that. I love that. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah. That is yeah. so awesome. <laughs> yeah. So that's why that's actually one of the big reasons that I wanted you to come on the podcast is because of the message behind it, because it is so relevant for today. What ways does, does your main character show kindness? She's, she's just by, at first, she's just being friendly, you know, mm. waving and smiling yeah. and, yeah. and taking an interest in other people. Yeah. You know, and uh, at the end, she's actually offers her scarf to one of the characters that that um, doesn't accept it, which is part of the, I, the idea too. But the thing is, you keep offering, you keep loving, you yeah. keep showing kindness because there are people that will accept it, that are open to it. And, you know, it, it is just simple gestures. You know, when you turn a light on the room, in the room, nobody pays attention to the light. It's just what they see in the room. And that's what we do when we show forth that kindness it's not about us it's them seeing the light of god mm -hmm. you know it's it's them seeing god's character and uh and we can do that anywhere at any time and children can do it and yeah. and children can be some of the best people to do it because people are already open to children you know they they already have a soft spot most people for children mm -hmm. so they have this this influence and if they just use it for good you mm -hmm. know when you do an act of kindness, you're not just doing it, you're inspiring somebody else. Absolutely. To and do it. Yes, you are. You're fueling them. There's a story, it still hurts me. My mom, this is a story from my mom. Uh, she worked in Manhattan for 15 years. And one day she was walking down the street and an old man had, uh, a homeless man had fallen on the sidewalk. And True to New Yorkers, they just, you know, the whole stream of traffic just went right around him like he wasn't there. You know, everybody just walking, walking right around him. And my mom uh, stopped and helped him up. And she said when she helped him up, his eyes filled with tears. And my mom says, are you okay? You know, it, are you hurt? Is everything okay? And he said, you're the first person to touch me in 20 years. Wow. And I thought that there are people in the world that no one has even made physical, just a gentle helping somebody up in 20 years. And we wonder why people become serial killers and do incredibly awful things. It's because they've never had the love. They've never been touched with the love and kindness of God. They've known nothing but evil and, and wickedness their whole life. So just just how one thing can make such a difference for a person. Mm. It's just, it's, it's incredible, you know? And would you say that that's your, your heart for your book is that it would inspire people? Yes, absolutely. And not just children, you know, I mean, I've heard from a lot of adults. Wow. This is, this is an incredible story. This is a great reminder of what we need to be doing, mm. you know? And that's, that's my goal, you know? What advice would you give to someone who wants to be an author? First of all, make sure it's what the Lord wants you to do. Otherwise, you're fighting an uphill battle. Uh, second, keep writing. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but the one thing I've learned about the Lord in anything we do is if you don't prepare, he can't use you. Mm. No, not in that area. Of course, he can use you in other areas. but but we have to be prepared. And, and so don't jump the gun. Don't think it has to happen right away. Just write mm -hmm. and read. That's the other one, reading and writing. A lot of people I've heard say, oh, I, I don't really read. And they want to be an author. I'm like, you don't really want to be an author if you don't want to read. Mm -hmm. and, and when I say reading, you may not be able to take the time to physically read, but you can always listen to audiobooks. The right. important thing is to understand how words work together, how they flow together, how one sentence from a book can just revolutionize the way you see things, you know, to internalize those things. I mean, if it's the path the Lord wants you on, you need to, you need to work on it, you know, 
That would be my main advice because if you start there, God can do something with that, you know, and he will, he will. Yes. I love that. Um, so your book is a picture book. So it's obviously an age range thing. How do you yes. go about choosing? Um, they actually, the, the publishing company chose the age range for me. Okay. So, but with my other two novels, they're young adult. And so, um, really you have to be familiar with, again, you have to be familiar with the literature. Okay. So if you want to write for young adult, read young adult, mm -hmm. listen to young adult, um, pay attention. Usually the difference between young adult and adult literature, good young adult uh, literature is um, not the complexity of it, but the complexity of the language. Mm. So if you're going to work with uh, young adult novels, make sure that um, the vocabulary is something they're going to understand. You know, I don't want to say eighth grade is a, a really good way to shoot, really even for adult novels. That's why a lot of young adults are read by adults, because if it's well written, the complexity is the same, mm -hmm. but it's easier to read. It's just, yeah. it's not like trying to slog through some deep literary masterpiece that every word you really have to work to, to internalize. It's just real easy reading and, and clear. Yeah, pay attention to the craft. I mean, okay. that's a huge aspect. Do you find it difficult to write for different, different well, it's different genres and different age groups. And you know, like for me, I started off with a nonfiction. I've got <laughs> currently working on a story that is a fiction book. Nice. But I'm finding it really difficult to switch between the two because nonfiction is is easy it's like you tell them like this is it this is the information you need fiction i'm now telling a story while trying to produce a message so i'm finding it difficult do you, you find mean, that difficult not not when i'm editing but definitely when i'm writing right. um because it is a different mindset and so what you'll find what every author will find as they start to write is you'll fall into a niche mm -hmm. i mean that's that's just the way it happens. You'll fall you you'll fall into what works for you. I mean, we say oh, I want to be an author, I want to be a writer, but so many things are written. I mean, there are people that just write blogs. The books they've had have come from blogs. That's that's been their niche. Short, you know, three hundred word little hits that that really work. So then there's other people that are very literary. They may have a, a much smaller audience of well-educated usually english majors because most other people aren't that interested but you know whatever whatever that niche is there's an audience for that niche and trying to write outside of it is a uh, really frustrating mm. and and but the only way you you know is by trying trial and error you know i've learned as much as i'd like to write blogs my my blogs are they're more like essays and they're just, they're too much. I mean, I don't even, you know, I like enjoy writing them, but I think who's going to read these, you know, <laughs> you know, really, again, people that are really interested in literature or words mm -hmm. might, but otherwise, yeah, I found as much as I just, I just can't do blogs. I can do nonfiction. I struggle with, with uh, fiction as well, but my novels, I see them more as screenplays. So it's not the rich literature that I love to read. I can't write that as hard as I try. It's not my niche, but I know there is a niche for me. So, you know, I would encourage authors to just find it. And again, you only find it by writing it and, okay. and you'll know it not because it's easy, but because it's good. Mm. You you're able to, it energizes you. It doesn't drain you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it, definitely. You, you start writing and it's like, okay, you just you want to fix it there's a there's a compulsion to mm. to write it i don't know how else to explain it but yeah it's like anything else you find what you're good at in it what is your biggest struggle or limiting belief that you've had before i realized it's not my book <laughs> i mean i'm the babysitter but it's not mm. my book i was thinking it was my book and i could never do it and i'm not good enough and how can I do all the marketing and da 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 on and on and on because I'm just not very good at so many things. 
Um, so those were definitely limiting beliefs. But once I took a step back and, and it's interesting, again, Rick Renner taught me this because if you watch him, he's a very, got a very good, very humble heart. And if you watch him, um, when he advertises his books, he's always talking about the book, not mm. himself, you know? And when you say my book, you're talking about yourself. But right. when you say, you look at the book as an objective thing, this is something that the Lord gave me to babysit. You can, you can see it very differently. You can suddenly it's a, it takes the, it takes the limiting belief that you're, that it's based on you off. Mm. At least that's what it did for me, you know? So when I look at it, okay, this, this is something that God gave me that I really feel like one of the reasons it's wordless is so it can go into any country in the world and be understood. Mm. I mean, this is something that the, the company was super excited about because they've never done a wordless picture book before. This is something that God has just opened doors all over the place and I need to do my due diligence, but the limits are really on him. You see what I'm saying? So mm. if we put our faith in him, it's kind of like anything else. That kind of gets rid of those limiting beliefs. I did struggle with him. I think every author does. It's like the enemy's biggest thing. You're not good enough. Why would anybody want to read your book? What do you think? You know what I'm yeah. saying? What, what could you possibly have to say in a world that puts out 50,000 books a year, you know? But if it's a God idea, somebody needs it. Mm -hmm. I mean, somebody needs it. And if, God, if, you're gonna, if God's going to put it through all the expense and all the stuff that it takes and all the time, it's more than one person, you know? And, mm -hmm. and God's going to get it to the right people. He'll help you find the right people. And so that's kind of the thing that, that I would say, a, a way of dealing with limiting beliefs. Remember, it's not, it's not about you, mm -hmm. you know? You may be the author or whatever, but it's not about you and your book. It's about what God's doing. And when you do that, it just kind of lifts it, mm -hmm. lifts the limiters off, you know? Yeah. You know? yeah he's, he's called us. He's made us worthy. He mm -hmm. says we're good enough to do it. He's called us to do it. Well, then I'm going to give it my whole heart. You know? mm. No, that's good. Because my, my first book is about um, how to write your story, but infuse the gospel message into it so you can share with others. Um, it's oh, called right. um, Your Story is Worth Telling. And I, I really yeah. struggled with like, who are you? You're a nobody. Nobody knows you. You have no connections. That was my, right. my biggest no platform. Stop. <laughs> yeah. I'm like... You know, and I was listening to a podcast was talking about how to deal with your limiting beliefs. And it was um, Michael Hyatt. Uh, nope. It was um, Dream Think Do with Mitch Matthews. He had a guest on and she was saying that you make a list of all your limiting, limiting beliefs, everything like biggest ones to the smallest ones and one comma. And then you answer those limiting beliefs on the other. Like, oh, nice. you, you know, nobody knows you. Nobody knows me yet. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I went and did that and I found that that really helped me to yes. to look at that and be like, you know what? Yeah, nobody knows me yet, but what they will, people will. People will yes. get it. You know, and that really helped me be like, Psh, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's we serve a limitless God. Mm. So if we and if he's called us, what can't we do, you know? Absolutely. I love that. Okay, one final question, because I'm aware of time, so I, I want to respect your time. Oh, you're good. Thank you. My final question is, what is one thing that you wish you had known when you started out? Just what we talked about, okay. that the limiting beliefs are, are just that. If you, if you listen to them, they will rob years mm. of productive time. Um, just thinking you're not good enough, or how could I ever do that, or... I think if I had known earlier, I would be, I would, well, I know I would be farther along with the, the books because the Lord's put several on my heart and I know I'd be further along with them in the process had I not been so governed by my limiting beliefs, mm -hmm. just fear, you know, fear that you're not good enough. And that's, you know, that's a trick of the enemy. We see it in other places, but somehow we look at other people's writings. And of course, as an English major, I've read, you know, the most incredible, beautiful pro prose and poetry that brings tears to your eyes. And you listen and you think, how, 
how did they put that in words, that thought? How did they do that, you know? There's no way I'll ever be able to do that. Mm. But that's okay. That's not what God's called you to do. Whatever he's called you to do, you be faithful, he'll equip you, and, and you'll do what he's called you to do, you know? So if I had known that sooner, and that's what I would say to any author, know that if, if it's the first thing to settle is, is this what God wants you doing? If it's what you, if God wants you doing it, do it with all your heart. Just mm -hmm. know that, okay, if he said I can do it, I can do it. If he wants me to do it, hey, I can do it. It's not going to be easy. Like anything else we do for God, there's going to be roadblocks. There's going to be trouble. But you take that limiting belief off, you can do anything. Mm, I love that. Oh, yeah. Dagby, thank you so much for, for getting on. Um, how can people connect with you? Uh, so I have a website. I, I don't want to say it's sorely neglected, but it's there, dagnygriffin.com. Um, I have a, an email address, and I'd love to hear from people that read. I've had all sorts of testimonies um, from people that have read it and their children have read it. It's just, it's so wonderful to me. Mm. Pictures and anything like that, they can send to shine at dagnygriffin.com. Um, I'm also on uh, Instagram. I think it's Dagny Dawn mm -hmm. on Instagram and uh, Facebook. So I would love for them to just look me up and say hi and ask questions. I'm totally... It's always been my heart to help people write. Mm. Uh, so, you know, if you have questions or comments that I can answer fairly quickly, not like, can you look at my novel and tell me <laughs> what it needs? You know, because I probably can't do that. I don't have time to do that. But, but, you know, if you have questions and I can help you help even one person just a little further down the road, you know, mm. kind of have the same heart you do, Kenny, you know, to just we've got a job to do. This is what God's called us to do. We just need to help others do it as well. I absolutely loved having Dagny on the show today. She is such a wellspring of knowledge and it was so great to have her perspective as an author, but also as an editor. As I talked to Dagny, I could really hear her heart to inspire others, to inspire kids to reach out and to impact those people around them with love and kindness, but also to inspire adults to do the same thing, especially in the times that we're living in now. A smile, a hello, a helping hand is all it takes to make an impact in the world and in the lives of people around us on a daily basis. My top three takeaways for today were your publishing team is not there to kill your baby. They are there to help them live. As an editor, Dagny is uniquely qualified to share from this perspective because she works with people all the time, helping them to fulfill their dream of writing a book. And it's so important that as authors, we remember that those people we hire to help us edit our books are there to make them better, to make it the best book that they can possibly be. The second thing that I got from this episode was, don't try and write for everyone. Find your niche and write for your audience. It can be so easy to try and be all things for all people. But it's okay to find our niche and to write for that audience, no matter how big or how small that may be. My third takeaway for today is if you listen to limiting beliefs, it will rob years of productive time. You heard from both Dagny and myself. As authors, we all have those self-doubts and limiting beliefs. But it's so important that we don't listen to them so we can fulfill that dream that's in our heart and write that book. Thanks for joining me today on the podcast. I know you could spend your time in so many different places, and I'm honored that you would choose to spend it with me. I want to encourage you, if you haven't already, to subscribe to the podcast so that you can automatically get the next episode when it comes out. And I also would like to invite you to join us at the Author Your Dream Facebook community. It's a great place to come together with like-minded people to inspire, encourage, and uplift each other as we each take our journey to publish our books.